So I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. What I aim to do is update the European management guidelines in light of new data. I'm going to show that lung biopsy, although very important, is not the gold standard and is just a stage in the journey. I'm going to emphasize the increasing importance of making a specific diagnosis. Incidentally, if anybody wants these slides, they are very welcome to them. Please email me or maybe the organizers can give them to you. So the presentation of interstitial lung disease is very non-specific. Either unexplained neonatal respiratory distress <coughs> or in the infant and older child, respiratory presentations, breathlessness going blue or non-respiratory including poor feeding and failure to thrive. There may be cyanosis, recession, crackles, the chest radiograph may be normal or very non-specific, and detailed further investigation is essential. These were the European guidelines, starting with a CT scan to make sure that child was, there was interstitial lung disease was present, progressing through tests, occasionally making a specific diagnosis. So I. My suggestion, the starting point, you suspect interstitial lung disease. The CT says, yes, this is, it is. You then go for non-invasive tests, blood tests, other imaging, invasive tests, and above all, try to make a specific genetic, environmental, or other acquired diagnosis. And there are numerous genes implicated. So what about diagnostic CT scans? You can see here in this CT scan a lot of soft, fluffy centrolobular nodules and this is extrinsic allergic alveolitis. You need a specific diagnosis, blood tests and environmental sampling to find the cause. Birds are the usual culprit but beware the parent who is a pigeon fancier and brings allergen on their clothes, the bird nest in the unused chimney or feather bedding. This is another diagnostic CT scan. You can see right middle lobe and lingular ground glass with perihyla shadowing. This is classical of knee high. It presents with tachypnea and oxygen dependence. Lung histology is normal, but the biopsy stains positive for bombesin. And you can make the diagnosis just on the CT scan in many cases. The prognosis is generally good, but there are underlying genetic causes, including TTF1 mutations and FOXP1 mutations. So here is a family with TTF1 mutations and knee high. Uh, the, ch the child, the first one was diagnosed aged seven months on a CT scan and biopsy. Here is the biopsy and here is the CT scan, both classical. This child was in oxygen during the day until age four, at night until age 17. Five close relatives had similar presentations with respiratory distress and they all had mutations in TTF1 in an evolutionary conserved region. One other family member was biopsied. So if you see knee high that is going on for a long time, then you must think about TTF1 mutations. What about non-invasive, non the environment? Take a very, very good history. Uh, remember from Korea. This was a ch in Korea. They had nearly 150 cases of a very severe interstitial lung disease with a 60% mortality. Here is the CT scan of very severe. And you can see on the biopsy, you can see fibrosis, um, foamy histiocytes, 
and this was humidifier disinfectant caused this disease. What about if you see a an interstitial lung disease, could it be iatrogenic? This is a five-year-old child with microcephaly and severe neurological handicap and choking, a chronic cough for a year, and the CT scan did not show aspiration, but showed these changes, this consolidation, this interstitial lung pattern, and this child was on nitrofurantoin, um, put by an, a urological surgeon because of a single kidney. This is nitrofurantoin lung. Vaping. I don't know if you have vaping yet in, in the Ukraine, but be careful, it is coming. It is dangerous. We have, th think if you see a funny interstitial lung disease, think vaping. Acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Eosinophilic pneumonia, lipoid pneumonia. Here you can see uh, the alveolar space is stuffed with lipid. Uh, respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. All of these things have been implicate, have had vaping implicated. So think about vaping if you see a funny lung disease. What about other imaging? So if you have a lung disease, neurological, think about an MRI scan. You can see this cerebellar hypoplasia and, periventric, left, and periventricular nodule, nodules. This is an FNLA mutation. Here, if, here you see uh, normal, here a, T, a TTF1 mutation with abnormal brain imaging and abnormal thyroid imaging. What about blood tests? Now there are a huge number of genes. Please do not try to read these or translate these. Surfactant production, surfactant catabolic disorders, developmental disorders, structural proteins, immune dysregulation, knee high, growth disorders. There are numerous genes and increasingly we are looking for specific genetics. Here are the, the disorders of surfactant production, surfactant protein B, ABCA3, surfactant protein C and TTF1 and surfactant protein B, typically they die without a lung transplant. Those with disorders of surfactant catabolism, numerous genes, but the important thing of making this diagnosis is that there are specific treatments like whole lung lavage and increasingly stem cell transplantation. And here are multi-system diseases and the importance of that is TMEM173 and LRBA each are treatable with a monoclonal antibody. So we really need to make a specific diagnosis. If you're thinking of systemic inflammatory diseases, again, do not try to translate all this, but there are numerous clues you can get from serological tests. What about the role of fiber optic bronchoscopy? I only do a bronchoscopy if I think it is likely that by doing a bronchoscopy I can reach a diagnosis without a biopsy. So the eosinophilic pneumonias is one such condition. Significant eosinophilic infiltrates which you can diagnose on a lavage. It's rare in developed countries and usually secondary to drugs or parasites. It may be a primary condition and it's usually steroid responsive. So here is a typical CT scan, and here on the lavage, you can see a lot of eosinophils. And this is a very nice review in pediatric pulmonology from the French group. What about alveolar hemorrhage, a typical CT scan and chest X-ray? It may be syndromic with renal disease, upper airway disease. There may be diagnostic serology for the, of these conditions, or it may be single organ disease, sometimes with just isolated pulmonary vasculitis. 
and you can see the vasculitis here, a, neutro, a neutrophilic vasculitis on this biopsy. And the role of biopsy in this condition is quite controversial. What about lung biopsy? Well, it's not part of the picture. The same morphological pattern may be caused by multiple different genetic mutations. And the same genetic mutation can cause multiple different biopsy abnormalities. And these may change over time. Finally, the biopsy may point the way to further investigations, for example, of an immunodeficiency or specific genetic studies. So here, neonatal severe interstitial lung disease, typically full term, re immediate onset of respiratory distress, ventilated with stiff lungs, typical chest x-ray, diffuse ground glass shadowing, you need to consider the alveolar capillary dysplasia spectrum, particularly if it's rapidly progressive, and also consider surfactant protein mutations. Here is a biopsy from one of our cases. You can see the capillaries full of red cells, and there is very little airspace alveoli at all. Asthma dysplasia, alveolar capillary dysplasia and misaligned pulmonary veins. These children progress rapidly to ECMO and we biopsy them early to try to avoid a long and fruitless ICU course. And again, think of FOXF1 or STRA6 mutations. Uh, here is a, such a, another case. The brown is an endothelial marker, and you can see the capillaries are very far away from the alveolar spaces. And here you can see a pulmonary artery with pulmonary hypertension changes. The pulmonary vein, instead of being central lobular, is next to the pulmonary artery. And this child indeed had a FOXF1 mutation. So here, in terms of overlap, here are three different biopsies, all showing pulmonary alveolar proteinosis with filling of the alveolar spaces with this proteinaceous material. All of them, are, each of them is caused by a different gene. Here are other appearances, chronic pneumonitis of infancy, descommutative interstitial pneumonia, non-specific interstitial pneumonia, and again, different genes implicated. So, immunodeficiency-associated interstitial lung disease is very important. 20% of biopsies in children are under two, and 50% of biopsies in older children. The immune the immune dysfunction may not be readily apparent, and there's emerging evidence of promising clinical responses to targeted immunomodulation. So here are CT scans. They're nonspecific from four different children with immunodeficiency. Notably, this child with a very abnormal scan was actually very well indeed. And if you see lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, lymphoproliferative disease, cellular NSIP, follicular bronchiolitis, or cellular bronchiolitis, you should look for an immune dysfunction. You should send the child to a pediatric immunologist and tell them there is a diagnosis to be made. So again, you can see the same mutation, in this case ABCA3, in infancy causing pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, or it can cause descommutative interstitial pneumonia. You can see the macrophages, or a nonspecific interstitial pneumonia pattern. Furthermore, 
in the same child, this is a biopsy at three weeks, and this is a biopsy of the same child at four years of age, very different histology. And the same again here, uh, an evolving biopsy picture. I'm not sure why they biopsied the child twice, but they did. But the important point is that the biopsy findings are not static. So the same genetic abnormality may give different histological patterns, even within the same family. Within an individual, the histological pattern may change over time. Uh, the same histological pattern may be a manifestation of many different genetic disorders. And if you do a biopsy, that's not the end of the diagnostic journey. You need to focus further diagnostic efforts into making a specific diagnosis. So what are my take-home messages from this talk? We need to move towards specific genetic and environmental causes. Non-specific non phrases like NSIP and DIP are just descriptions and do not help us. Lung biopsy is a staging post on the diagnostic journey. It's not the end of the journey and it should stimulate a search for the underlying cause. And I think we will be making more and more diagnoses in the future without resorting to a lung biopsy. So these are challenging times. There are my grandsons learning how to, how to climb. We are still like that, my grandsons still learning, still climbing to understand how best to manage interstitial lung disease in children. Thank you very much for your attention.